So we start um, moving towards the quantization of gravity. Now, in uh, the quantum level, you are, are not just interested in the solutions or the field equations. The action plays an important role because when you do not observe your object, it is everywhere, basically. And uh, so it's important to work with uh, the action, for example, the Hilbert action. And similarly, it's not convenient for various reasons to solve the gauge fixing, the, the gauge fixing conditions, or to use it as an equation. In uh, the classical level, we have uh, studied uh, at least uh, the quadratic, in the quadratic approximation, we have studied the field equations and the gauge fixing condition as equations. Here we cannot hang how well we can, but <clears throat> it's not the most convenient approach. So basically, you have to extend the action to a gauge fixed action, and uh, that is done in the following way we can have in mind this kind of gauge fixing, which is the harmonic condition, but actually what we are <coughs> going to say applies to <coughs> every kind of condition that does fix the gauge. And uh, the gauge fixed action, so GF, is equal to the starting action, SH, plus some something that we write like this it's the square of the gauge fixing <coughs> with in front a, an arbitrary parameter lambda which is called gauge fixing parameter actually you can also insert if you want an arbitrary parameter there that's another gauge fixing parameter But I'm not allow, allowed to change my action like that, the way uh, it comes to my mind. I have to do things in order to... Don't, I cannot change the physics. And uh, it can be shown, shown that this is the right way to do it, adding a, another contribution which is called ghost action which involves um, two new fields C bar mu which are called anti-ghosts and C mu we will write them with upper indices which are called ghosts or to be precise, since there are other ghosts that we will meet, Fadev Popov ghosts. And basically, the ghosts correspond to the gauge freedom, the gauge transformations. and the anti-ghosts correspond to the residual gauge freedom. Mm. 
Moreover, um, these fields have the opposite, have the wrong statistics. But does it mean that even if they are vectors, because they have an index mu, they have the, the statistics of uh, fermions, um, which means that there are some minus signs around, or that they behave like differential forms, so they anti-commute. So that means that uh, they are expressed in terms of uh, the so-called uh, Grassmann variables. which are assumed to anti-commute. And that means that the anti-commutator, which is The anti commutator theta i theta j, which is theta i theta j <coughs> minus theta j theta i, that is zero. Always. So it's like differential forms. When you exchange, you just have to uh, remember that when you exchange them, uh, there is a minus sign. And uh, theta i then goes into C x. The index i becomes the space time point. Same for C bar. There is nothing else that we need to know about this, and since we will not use them very much, uh, but we have to, to mention them for completeness, otherwise the entire construction breaks down, falls apart. Um, we don't need to enter into the details, but, but we have to do... What is the reason behind this wrong statistics? The reason behind the wrong statistics is that, in some sense, these extra fields subtract degrees of freedom. And so, remember last time we said that the elicities in d dimensions of g mu nu are the components of g mu nu minus 2d. And minus 2d is precisely the components of c bar and c. And the minus is due to the wrong statistics. Now this is a vague statement that these extra fields <laughs> exactly subtract unwanted degrees of freedom. The, the, the extra uh, non-physical non components of GB nu, but it can be made precise and we will um, give details on this and we will also uh, make a comparison with uh, the gauge fields to make the argument simpler, so it will be possible to follow it. Let us uh, write the general form of S ghost, which is valid for every theory and every gauge fixing. So, this part I'm writing here is completely general, and I repeat, it is valid for every gauge theory and every gauge fixing. So you can choose the gauge fixing you want and you can do it for the gauge symmetry you want. Yamnese, whatever. And this uh, action has the following form. It's the integral d4x c bar mu writing the anti ghosts that we have here. Otherwise you replace this with the anti ghost that you work with. And then you differentiate um, the gauge fixing with respect to its own fields, which is uh, the, the, phi, uh, the phi, the fluctuation around flat space. And you um, multiply, you contract that with the variation, the infinitesimal variation of that field, 
with parameters C. So the parameters instead of calling them xi mu killing vectors, uh, we call them C from now on, uh, because C is the, the preferred name for ghosts and uh, C bar for anti-ghosts. So basically, this thing is what? D4x C bar mu. Here there should be another integral actually because this is in x, this is in x. The functional derivative should be in different points, so it should trigger a delta function. Probably you are familiar with that. And so if you want, there is a D4y. But this, uh, uh, this object here is just the variation the variation of the gauge fixing under diffeomorphism, infinitesimal diffeomorphisms. I think we already wrote the infinitesimal diffeomorphisms, but probably we, however, stopped at, uh, we stopped to the lowest order. Now we write the full expression, which is uh, anyway here. Yes, th th that's exactly what we are inserting there. The variation of the gauge fixing, which we already wrote to the lowest order. But now we have to, to do it. There is one, just one correction, so there are not many orders. And, uh, uh, well, this is uh, the variation. So. So, um, we probably we can forget about this and do it in the other page. Just want to write the formula of uh, delta g mu is partial nu delta phi mu. So, partial nu delta c phi mu nu minus omega divided by 2 partial mu delta phi, delta c phi. And this delta c is the infinitesimal, the lead derivative, but for phi mu, which is directly related to the one of... Um, so recall that uh, the one of g mu. So recall that this is that, and that we write xi rho equal to um, what was it? 2k um, c 2k c Um, well, we didn't write it anyway. Yes, so 2kc. So 2kc rho. <coughs> and so 2k goes away and you have delta phi mu nu equal to uh, to the lowest order. Remember that this is g mu nu. So to the lowest order, this is an eta. And you get what we wrote before. And then you have a correction with 
the same expression basically in the one where xi becomes c to k is already out and uh, g mu becomes phi mu version C rho. So when you insert this expression in that uh, expression as ghost, you have the complete ghost action and then you have the complete gauge fixed action. What is interesting about this combination of two terms there? Well, you can show that if you add them like that uh, and the relation between the two is encoded into the gauge fixing because here there is <laughs> the gauge fixing and in s ghost there is the gauge fixing so once you choose that function g mu you determine this gauge fixed action automatically well you can show that the physical results which will be uh, uh, scattering processes because uh, quantum field theory is a theory of scattering which have to be defined in a way that we will see the physical results will be completely independent on these two terms that we have added. They will not depend on lambda, they will not depend on omega, they will not even depend on that function g mu. You can choose the function you want. Only the physical results. And what are the physical results? They are scattering processes where you have to be careful that the, the, the objects that you want to scatter are the elicities and not anything else. We know that G mu nu has many components, but only two are physical. You have to be to project your in and out states onto the subset of physical states, so you will not compute scattering processes of the other components of scattering processes of Fadeyev-Popov costs. If you compute Fadeyev uh, scattering processes of and physical components like the longitudinal component of the photon or temporal and longitudinal components of the, the metric or the fadeyev of course, those will depend on any, everything. They will depend on lambda, they will depend on omega, they will depend on the gauge fixing. But if you compute the physical processes only, which means scattering processes of the two elicities, then you don't have that dependence. And uh, this is encoded into SGF. R. It said we gauge independent. Physical processes are gauge independent. They do not depend on the gauge fixing parameters lambda omega and they do not depend on the gauge fixing condition function. It's not set to zero, so it's not a condition. If you want, it's a function. G mu. So if you want to use another function, you can use any other function you want. And to highlight some properties, it's uh, convenient to choose another function indeed. But for the moment, we continue with this one with the one we have uh, chosen. So I've given you enough uh, pieces of information to write down the ghost action as well, but we won't need it. Just need to, be, to, to know that it has to be there to have this property. So let's calculate now the quadratic part 
of the um, phi mu nu and also the quadratic part of the Gauss, okay? And uh, we will do it in uh, the case, so quadratic part, for omega equal one and lambda equal one half. <coughs> The results will not depend on these parameters, the physical results, but with these parameters, the formulas simplify enormously. So to compute the, 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 the quadratic part of the action, we have already computed actually the quadratic part of SH, so that is already done, and we just have to add the quadratic part of the quadratic, the, the square of the gauge fixing. So the quadratic part of the action is this one here. This one, and now you add what? One divided by two lambda. Lambda is equal to one half. So you just add the square of the gauge fixing. Plus, plus the square of the gauge fixing, and since there is a one half outside, we, we have to add twice the square of the gauge fixing inside. So twice partial nu, phi mu nu minus one half partial mu phi times partial uh, rho phi mu rho minus one half partial mu phi. This for the fluctuation of the metric. So let's compute it. First, four terms must be copied. Nu rho partial mu phi nu rho minus partial mu phi partial mu phi plus two partial mu phi partial nu phi nu mu minus 2 partial mu phi rho mu partial nu phi nu rho and then we have to add the rest plus 2 partial nu phi mu nu partial rho phi mu rho and there is the double product 2 minus 1 half minus 1 minus 2 partial mu phi <coughs> partial rho phi mu rho and finally plus two minus one half minus one half so that is plus one half partial mu phi partial mu phi <coughs> now see that there are some simplifications because these two terms cancel out as well as those two These and these subtract each other as well as these two. And what you remain with are only terms where you have partial mu, partial mu, which means boxes. That's very simple. These, this choice is the analog, the gravitational analog of what in QED you would call the Feynman gauge. Anyway, this is one half integral d for x partial mu phi nu rho partial mu phi nu rho minus here those two terms are <laughs> equal. There is a minus one and a minus one half. So you have minus one half partial mu phi partial mu 
Hi, and that's all. Or if you want, you can also write it like this d4x let me collect the phi menu on one side let me collect the box because when you integrate by part parts partial new becomes minus partial new and on that on the other partial new becomes a box box and then you can write a matrix and phi rho sigma and uh, I can uh, write this matrix as this, the identity, minus a trace part. The identity means that uh, phi mu nu, phi rho sigma, uh, the identity is an object with four indices, that is the identity, we will write it in a moment. But since it is a dead entity, it reproduces that thing. The other reproduces the other thing. The identity is the identity for matrices with two indices that are symmetric. So there is only one thing that you can write for the identity. And it is eta mu rho, eta nu sigma plus eta nu sigma, eta nu rho divided by two. eta mu nu rho sigma with phi rho sigma is phi mu nu. So it is the identity has to be symmetric in mu and nu and symmetric in the exchange of rho and sigma because it is the identity on symmetric tensors. So this is the quadratic part and if you want you can also add the interaction. And uh, <coughs> we have seen what the interaction was. It was just. Uh, <coughs> Minus k t mu nu phi mu nu. So if you want to write down the field equations after the gauge fixing. They gave minus box. This parenthesis eta mu rho eta nu sigma plus eta mu sigma eta nu rho that is this divided by two one half of uh, that combination and then there is minus one half of the trace combination So you have this kind of equation plus higher orders. And now you can, this is a gauge fixed equation, so you can work out the, the green function. The green function is the inverse of this. A momentum space which means that <clears throat> box goes into minus some squared momentum you have to uh, invert
this object k squared, this is k squared minus box times that thing. So k squared times that thing. And that, i that is easy uh, remembering that this is the identity because the inverse is equal to the same thing. Yes. So inverse we call the inverse P and that is equal to 1 over k squared times the same object in parentheses. Why is that? Uh, do the multiplication and you find 1. Let's, let's do it. P mu nu rho sigma q rho sigma alpha beta is what? So we basically just have to square this matrix because 1 over k squared and k squared go away. We just have to square that matrix and um, that's easy knowing that this is the identity. The rest is a simple trace so that's also not so difficult to manipulate. Let's see what happens. Identity times the identity, of course, is the identity. The double product is identity times whatever. It's the identity, it's the whatever. So the double product will be minus one half times two, so minus whatever. This is alpha beta. And then there is the product of the last ones, and that is <coughs> plus one fourth. And then you have eta mu nu, eta alpha beta, they stay away. Eta rho sigma, eta rho sigma is four, and that simplifies the one fourth. So you get one. So this is called propagator. I time multiplied by I actually is called propagator, the graviton propagator. contains a, a, a momentum, so we could say pi p mu nu rho sigma of k, and it is denoted by, graphically, we will need some graphical description now, by a wiggly line like this, with a momentum k, connecting, let's say, the initial state mu nu with the final one rho sigma. That's a very simple example of scattering amplitude where nothing scatters because it's just free. But if you want to, to see, to view this as a scattering amplitude, so let me write it explicitly. This is 1 divided by k squared, eta nu rho, eta nu sigma plus eta nu sigma eta nu rho minus eta mu nu eta rho sigma divided by 2. And uh, 
if you if we want the simplest example of uh, scattering amplitude uh, but we will come later to what they are more precisely that would amount to multiply uh, these uh, this object by the polarizations of the graviton graviton polarizations You have to remember that uh, in the scattering theory what you assume is that the initial and final states are free. Somehow they are so far from each other that they don't interact when they are far, so they are free. And so the graviton polarizations are described by what we have already found. Because the solution of the, for the graviton in the free field limit is given by that. This. These two degrees of freedom, A and B, are the graviton polarizations. And we have expressed that matrix as the sum of the basis of polarizations. It's basically just a two by two matrix. But here you have already decided everything. So you have decided your frame for the momentum. You have already gauge fixed. You have already used the, the field equations. So there is. Nothing else you can do that's already settled. <clears throat> so the graviton polarizations are these objects. What can we do with that? We can um, study, check what happens when we compute that propagator with physical polarizations. And that means what? Um, well, for example, mu and nu. So there is an i, there is a 2, there is a k squared. So mu could be 1, 1, or 1, 2. Two one or two two. And uh, well, one thing that uh, that's easy actually. It's uh, too easy, not. Uh, so we have to compute um, this object. So we just need to compute this matrix times this times another matrix. But remember that the polarizations are <coughs> traceless. Since they are traceless, the traces do not count. But what remains is one is the identity. So basically there is nothing there. You just have to square that. So what you get is phi mu nu phi mu nu. Because the traces are zero. So as, long, as soon as you contract this with phi rho sigma tilde, you lose that. But that is the identity. So you get phi tilde mu nu. So what you're interested in is phi tilde mu nu, phi tilde mu nu, and that is 2 a squared plus b squared. So what's important here is the following thing. Apart from the i, which is a useful convention for various purposes, for various purposes you see the following thing, that when you compute this thing, you have a pole, k squared equals 0, 
this is a pole of this expression, and you have a residue, and the residue is positive. The pole means that you are on shell. So uh, physical processes should be on shell because you want physical processes. They are poles of uh, scattering metrics. But there is one important property that here we have uh, checked and we will see where it comes from. It comes from unitarity. The residue apart from the I of the pole should be zero. So the pole of a propagator is k squared equals zero. That means on shellness condition, which means that your graviton is not virtual. It's a physical one. And since it is a physical one, it should have k squared equals zero. Indeed, the, the polarizations, external polarizations we have solved, were solved by putting a k squared equals zero. And the residue at the pole I times something positive, which is not true if you do not put the external polarizations because if you do not project to these particular external states there are components here that give negative residues. And there is another negative uh, or actually even more awkward propagator here which is the propagator of the ghosts and uh, these vectors which have uh, wrong statistics. So those are also not physical. But you get rid of the ghost because there is no physical polarization for the ghosts. So even if they have a propagator, the ghosts have a propagator, you don't care because there is no physical polarization you can attach to them. <coughs> the only physical polarizations are these. So physical polarizations are, let's say, 5 tilde mu nu equal to that, c mu tilde equals 0, c bar tilde mu equals 0. There are no physical polarizations by definition for the ghosts. And in the end, you just propagate those two degrees of freedom. Now we will see these things a little bit better. <clears throat> and actually, you can see them better by comparing with QED. So, if we want to study QED, we have minus one half, sorry, one fourth, <coughs> f minus squared. Let's say we want to study the gauge fixed Lagrangian. <coughs> and then we add the same thing we did for gravity. <coughs> so, we add 1 divided by 2 lambda is the square of a gauge fixing plus the ghost part. So 1 divided by 2 lambda, the square of the gauge fixing, normally we choose this gauge fixing, so let's square it. And then you add the ghost part, which means 1 anti-ghost, 1 because there is only one gauge freedom, times the variation of the gauge fixing conditions times the, the variation the infinitesimal <coughs> variation of the gauge field. 
that's it. And let us compute it with lambda equal 1, where this is the gauge, the Feynman gauge. <coughs> So that is equal to 1 divided by 4, which becomes 1 divided by 2 if I make f minu explicit. The first one remains like that, and the second one I simplify to d mu a nu by using the anti-symmetry of the first, and that drops a factor 2, plus 1 half. 1 half lambda is equal to 1 d mu a mu squared and plus c bar, what is this derivative here? This thing is just equal to partial mu. Because you have d mu a mu and then you drop a mu. So you have this. But here also we have a, gauge, a huge simplification because you see here you have plus one half divergence squared. But if you integrate by parts, here you have minus one half. Check the first term. The first term is partial mu a nu, partial mu a nu. And by means of, the, of a partial integration, you can write it as minus box. In the second term, by means of two partial integrations, you can exchange those two derivatives, partial mu to the left and partial mu to the right, and then you have a something wrong here, because uh, that is plus one half partial mu a mu squared. So instead of simplifying, yes, here you have to, to use the same notation, you have to use lambda equal minus 1. You can use lambda, the lambda you want, but uh, so no, this is uh, not the normal lambda. Yes, here I have used the minus. If you want to simplify, the results will not change in the end. But if you want to simplify the maximum, the most simplification is by choosing lambda equal minus 1 in this notation. And so you lose that contribution. And you remain with those things. And uh, if you want to describe this by means of a propagator for the photon, you have to do what? I, you invert this, that's a k squared. There is a contraction, eta mu nu, and there is also a minus sign, which is why the, the vectors have a minus sign in it. Scalars do not have, spin 2 doesn't have, it goes with the oddity of the, the spin. And you will have also a, an, a, a similar i divided by k squared, a propagator for the ghosts, which is denoted somehow like that. Doesn't really matter. What's important here is that you propagate four degrees of freedom here. Two, this is complex, C and C bar there, but those are somehow negative, and uh, they subtract. How to see, uh, in general, that they subtract? You can see it by choosing a different gauge, a different gauge condition, where they do not need to subtract because they are not there. Uh, there is a gauge condition, and since with this combination of terms, the physical results will not depend on, on your gauge fixing condition, you can switch to this gauge condition, which we'll do in the second part, which is the Coulomb gauge, where they don't need to compensate each other because they will be only, you will only propagate everywhere inside, even inside the diagram, only the two uh, physical 
helicities. The reason why that gauge is not used to make calculations is that it's nice to see unitarity, but it is not nice to make calculations. So in the end, calculations are done like this. But you, we will see this uh, in the next hour. <laughs>